Welcome to the 7th AG screencast on grid computing. Today we will discuss basic concepts of MPI, the versions that are supported on the grid, and the submission of MPI jobs through the MPI start mechanism. MPI stands for Message Passing Interface, and it is currently the most commonly used interface for the development of parallel applications. When we talk of parallel applications, we refer to applications that spawn over several processes. These processes are then, in the common case, mapped over an equivalent number of processors, or physical CPUs, and thus each process runs conceptually on one physical CPU. These processes may communicate with one another by passing information, or messages, in MPI terminology, thus the term message passing interface. Software developers usually turn to MPI or some other suitable API in order to produce a parallel version of an initially serial application. In such a case, the goal is to balance the CPU load of the serial application over several physical CPUs, thus reducing the overall execution time. In the ideal case, the execution of the application is two times faster, each time we double the number of processors. In the real world, however, this is not the case, as the communication across the various processes and the synchronization points add up to the overall execution time. In addition, not all portions of the initial application are parallelizable. Even so, MPI has become pretty much the de facto standard when it comes to developing parallel applications. MPI can be used both for shared memory and distributed memory parallel applications. The difference between the two types of applications is that in shared memory applications, processes read and write to a common memory address space, whereas in distributed memory applications, each process has a separate address space. The main advantage of developing distributed memory applications, where MPI has prevailed as an API, is that the application may execute processes on several physical machines, accessing the local memory on each machine and using the local area network in order to exchange messages with the other processes. Thus, even with commodity hardware, one may develop a distributed memory application that may run on several hundreds of physical CPUs using MPI. Three different implementations of MPI are currently supported on the AG grid. These are MPI CH1, MPI CH2, and OpenMPI. MPI CH1 is based on the MPI1 standard, and it is pretty old relatively to MPI CH2 and OpenMPI, which are based on the MPI2 standard. Using the MPI start mechanism, the various MPI implementations are handled in a transparent way, as we will see in just a short while. Moving on to the demonstration of the MPI start mechanism, we start off by logging into the user interface where we have prepared a simple hello world example. We firstly view the source code which is written in C++. As you can see on the top section of the source code, we include the mpi.h header file. If this was a Fortran source code, we would have to include the mpif.h header file. Moving on to the main function, we start by declaring two integers, rank and size. We then initialize the MPI environment with MPI init and make two function calls that initialize the rank and size variables. At this point, you should keep in mind that each variable in an MPI program exists as a copy on its process memory. Thus, if we have a variable A of type integer, this could have a different value on its process in the pool of processes. In our case, the value of the variable rank is unique per process. The MPI com rank function assigns to that variable an integer ranging from 0 to n minus 1, where n is the total number of processes. If we thus execute this program on four processes, rank will be assigned the values 0, 1, 2, and 3, one unique per process. The variable size, on the other hand, is common to all processes. It is initialized with the MPI comp size function call, and it is equal to the total number of MPI processes. When executing the following C out command, its process prints the values of variables rank and size that it carries. The MPI section is then ended with a call to the MPI finalize function. Notice that MPI programs may be run locally on one CPU. Even if it makes no sense at this point, it is useful in the case we are developing our application. 
I will use the modules environment to fix my environmental variables and compile my source code with the MPICC wrapper script. Notice that I am using MPICH1, something that will show up again in the JDL file. To execute the program, I simply type that slash and the name of the executable. Now that we have gained some insight on what our program does, we turn to the JDL file that we will use in order to submit it as a job to the grid. Notice that the job type is normal, as this is just another usual batch job for the grid. Also notice the CPU number attribute, where we select how many MPI processes and fast physical CPUs we want our executable to run on. The executable script is named mpi-start.sh and we will see its contents in just a short while. Notice that it accepts two arguments, the first one being the name of the executable and the second one the name of the implementation I am using. Next, the std output, std error, input sandbox and output sandbox attributes are defined as usual. Notice lastly that in the requirements attribute two special requirements are inserted. We next view the contents of the MPI start.sh script. Even though this looks pretty complex, in the common case one does not need to make any serious changes here, if any at all. In the first two lines the arguments are picked up and stored in the appropriate environmental variables. Then the whole path of the user is set up and in the end the MPI start mechanism is called through the i2g MPI start variable. At this point, our program will run in parallel on number of the sources we have requested within the JDL file. Notice, however, that we have the opportunity to pre-process our input or post-process our output using the mpi-hooks.sh script. In our case, as you can see, this is empty, but if we wanted to download any input data or upload any output data, this would be the place to do so. Before submitting the job, I create a short term proxy and using GLI WMS job list match, I get the list of available resources for my job. I then submit the job using the GLI WMS job submit command as usual. Once the status of our job is in the done success state, we may retrieve the output as usual using the GLI WMS job output command. We then enter the directory that our output files have been stored into and as you can see, the stdr file is empty and the std.out file contains the output of our job. Since we chose to use the flags verbose and debug in our mpi start.sh script, lots of information has been written to this file. By scrolling down using the arrow keys, we eventually spot the output that has been written directly by our executable. As you can see, these are four lines, each one printed by a unique MPI process and each one containing the output of the rank and size variables per process. If we would like to have less output written in the std.out file, we may go back to the execution script mpi start.sh and comment out the verbose and debug flags we have used in the first place. This concludes our simple introduction to MPI and the MPI start submission mechanism. During our next screencast, we will review GFAL and other GLite services. Until then, thank you for watching.